So what I'd like to do today is to try to answer four different questions. Uh, as a policy matter, charter schools are the largest school reform initiative in the United States. As you probably already know, there's over 6,000 charter schools operating today. They take 2.4 million students, and there's another million students on the list. So clearly, the performance of charter schools, not only as vehicles for education, educating groups of students, but also as a policy instrument for trying to improve public education in general, is an important one, and one that we've been trying to answer for the last eight years. So we want to know, how do they compare to the traditional public schools in the same communities? And we use a very special technique to do that, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The, the second thing we want to do is to do a little bit of a deeper dive. Uh, we want to know, are there particular school characteristics, or are there particular groups of students for whom charter schooling is more successful? So in other words, are there sweet spots within the landscape of charter schooling? Can we identify sweet spots that would lead us to say, if we did more of this, we'd have better outcomes? And finally, I'm going to be looking at some of these operational or uh, policy instruments uh, as uh, a possible explanation for the kind of quality that we see uh, when we look at charter schools. Well, <clears throat> I mentioned that we did two different studies, and I mentioned that we had a data sharing agreement with California. Uh, one of the real challenges for us is to decide what the data window will be. And typically, we want to try to use as robust and more recent data as possible. And so what this slide shows you is that while we have data going back all the way to the spring of 2006, that would be from the 2005-2006 school year, we have a challenge about using all the data. So for the California study, uh, the analysis <coughs> was timed in such a way that we could only use data up <coughs> to uh, the spring of 2011. But when we did the Los Angeles, study, we wanted to get a very contemporary view. And so we were able to actually get the, another year of more recent data, and then chose to only go through three time periods. Now why is this important? Well, we are really interested in the estimating what the impact of schools are on the cognitive skills of students. And the reason that we care about that is because the cognitive skills, what, what kids actually know, turns out to be extremely important in terms of their eventual economic success, their family stability as adults, their self-sufficiency, and that translates into uh, the vibrancy of economies of states and nations. And so while there are lots and lots of other outcomes that we might care about, and in fact we do, we tend to focus on cognitive skills because there is this direct causal link to good public policy outcomes that in fact create better welfare for nations and states. Well, in order to do that, looking at just what kids know, there's a large body of evidence that says what they know is determined in large part by their family background. And so if you just look at snapshots of what kids know, an individual test score in a given year, all you're going to do is bring along all of those differences in family background. So instead what we want to do is we want to look at academic progress or growth or gain scores. And that's why we need multiple years of data. Because it takes two different data points on a kid in succession for us to be able to take away all of those other uh, personal characteristics of the student and isolate what the student had, how the student has progressed, right? And if we have the same kid in two different years, their family background is stable over that time. And so what they gain then is much closer to a measure, not perfect, but much closer to a measure of what the school is actually doing. So we need to have multiple years of data in order to create growth periods. So from one year to the next is a growth period. And what you can see here, <clears throat> is that we had five growth periods for the California study. That makes it extremely stable. It makes it a um, historically true and stable measure. 
Uh, but it also then gets dragged down a little bit by history. And I'll show you what that looks like when we actually start looking at various time periods. For the Los Angeles study, we only use three years of data, and that's two growth periods. So we have five growth periods on one side and two growth periods on the other. All right? Well, you folks know the California policy landscape probably far better than I do. But one of the attributes of the STAR testing program is that it doesn't test all students. It does a great job with the students who do test, but there are students that are left out. And so while charter school enrollment may be growing, it turns out that a lot of that growth is in early days. We're opening more elementary schools than middle schools and high schools, and it takes a while for students to grow up enough to be in a grade that's tested. So we have to restrict our sample to students for whom we have an outcome measure, i.e. a test score, in two successive periods. In California, that means the first time we can get a growth period is at the end of third grade. Okay, that's fine. Uh, <clears throat> we know that students differ a lot in the family <coughs> background. And so if charter schools were a perfect representation of the traditional schools in their communities, we could do school to school level analysis. But we know that that's not the case, and I'll show that in a moment. And so what we have to do is we actually have to look at individual students and find an appropriate counterfactual or comparison for that student. And the way that we do that is to match them. And <clears throat> so what we end up with then is out of the population of charter school students, we get the tested students, and then we get a smaller subset for those for whom we're able to find a match. All right? So what the match then gives us is for each student that we have a match, we get year, we get growth period records, right? If we see them for two years, that's one record. If we see them for another year, woo, a second record. Oh, thank you. That's good. We like that. Okay? And then we find matches for whom we can do the same thing. So you can see that there's a funnel here. And what we'll end up with, with after all of these growth period records are created, we average across all of the charter school students for all of the years for all of the records that we've been able to match. And what you end up with then is an average measure of how a typical charter school student will progress in their school setting compared to their counterfactual or their control kid who's had the same kind of background and same everything in the traditional public school setting. So let's talk about our match process. <clears throat> this has always been a big conundrum for charter school studies, getting the right match and getting enough of a match to be able to toss. We love the fact that there are random lottery studies, but the schools that actually go to lottery are not necessarily representative of the entire population of charter schools. And it turns out it's really difficult to run these lottery studies. We have something called lottery death. And that means out of the population that was the control group to begin with, that group winnows really quickly over time. They don't survive very well. And so you'll end up with a pretty robust test or case group and a, a, an atrophying control group. And that introduces some problems. So what we did instead was to say, okay, forget that. You know, not all, not all schools are doing lotteries, and lotteries are difficult to do to, to begin with, and they're really difficult to follow for long periods of time. So let's go and see if we can do something else. Let's find a matching methodology. <coughs> but we looked around, and there weren't any mathing, matching methodologies that we liked, so we just decided to make one up. And it's called the virtual control record. And I'll just briefly tell you what it is. Um, the details are on our website. There's a fabulous infographic if you want to go watch it to tell you how it all works. But essentially, we take a charter school and we find all of the public schools that have lost students to that school. Make sense? Okay, we call all of those the feeder schools. And so every single charter school has its own unique combination of population of feeder schools. And a traditional public school could be a feeder school to a lot of different charter schools. That's fine. They can show up in lots of these things. But we take one charter school and their feeder schools and we list all of the students. We gather all the students and all the student records that we 
and then we take one student, the first student in the charter school, <coughs> Sally. And we talk about all of Sally's characteristics, right? We got them all listed here. They're good. We can see that she looks like a particular way. We then go into that whole list of students that are in the feeder pool, and we find all of the little Sallies. And believe it or not, that really works. So then you end up with multiple Sallies in the traditional setting. And then we say, OK, we've matched you on demographics and on your eligibility for program participation, like SPED or free lunch. But we really want to make sure that we've got the right family background and stuff, too. And so we match on prior test score. So we wait until we get our first test score. Remember, it takes two to make a go through. <coughs> first test score, that gives us a measure of where the kid is achievement-wise. And remember, back at the beginning, we said achievement sweeps in all of his family background. So by matching on all of the observable characteristics and on prior, then we only end up with a few little salaries over here. And they've got the exact same prior test score. So then we let them go for their year. These little Sallies are in traditional school and our Sallies in charter school. The next spring, they take their tests. Well, we've now got a growth increment on the charter school students. We've got a gain score, how much they progress, progress. And we have, let's just say there are four Sallies. We take the second test score and we average it. Okay, so they're real kids but we've got an average of their second test score. So now we have what we call a virtual kid, virtual Sally. She's the average test score, the average gain now of what those four students would have gotten compared to Sally. And so what we've ended up with then is a twin study. And it's just like Noah's Ark, two by two by two. Anytime we have a charter school kid in our study, we're always gonna have a twin. That's the only way that we can do it. But the good news is, <coughs> We get 93% of the students matched in Los Angeles. We get 88% of the students in California charter schools statewide matched up. Now it turns out the students that don't get matched turn out to be very fringy. They would be somebody who is an uh, English language learner but in the ninth decile and also has an IEP for some reason. I mean, there are, there are really seriously just one-off kids that you wouldn't find matches for no matter how far you looked. And so we can be very confident that we have a representative sample and we're very, very close to the population. So we can pretty much be sure that our results will generalize to the rest of the students that are not involved. So let's look at the demography. You're looking here at the Los Angeles, I'm sorry, at the California um, profile. And what you've got here is the characteristics of students in all the traditional public schools in the state as a whole. And then we've restricted the sample to only those feeder schools that we've used to match our students because we want to know are our charter schools looking like their communities. And then finally, the charter schools in California for whom we have tested records. And what you'll see is that the demography of the feeder schools looks a lot like the state as a whole. But our charter population for California charter schools does not look like their feeder population. We find that they are slightly less <clears throat> uh, in poverty. They're, they have lower proportions of English language learners. We have about half the proportion of special education students. <coughs> Interestingly, they are both more white and more black and less Hispanic. Uh, Pack Allen, uh, Pack, Pack Islanders and Native Americans typically show up in charter schools in smaller proportions than they find in other schools. So we are a, uh, a skewed population from the standpoint of being representative of even the communities from which they're drawn, which, which is why we cannot do a school-to-school -school analysis. Well, when we look at Los Angeles, I don't know what you think about Los Angeles, but I sort of thought it might be the same. Well, we find the same tendencies, but not to the same extent. So we find that there is a smaller proportion of students in poverty, but the difference is small. Likewise with English language learners and with special education students. For me, the stronger proportion of black students is interesting. 
the smaller proportion of Hispanic students, given the demography of Los Angeles, is extremely interesting to me. Um, and the fact that we have more white students in charter schools than in the district as a whole uh, caused me to go back and dig into the data. And it turns out that there's a cluster of charter schools in Pacific Palisades, which turns out to be very white. Uh, and those students are largely white and high performing to begin with. And they turn out to skew much of this. Uh, so again, given the fact that these demographics are so different, we have to really focus in on the student to student twin study. And that's what we've done. And so what I'd like to do is very quickly run through the results that we get from the California statewide study and the Los Angeles study. These results are found on our website. You can find both reports. I encourage you to download them, take them home, make them your own. Uh, what I really want you to focus on today is that we are uh, really just talking about general tendencies relative to the traditional public school settings that they're, they're compared to, right? So they're twin, twin experience. What you see here is uh, the performance of the overall state and Los Angeles in terms of an average gain that a student would get in the course of a year if they enrolled in charter schools compared to what they would have learned in their traditional public schools. So in, these, in this particular uh, slide, the zero line actually represents the learning gain that a traditional public school student would get. And we're always going to be setting that comparison bar to zero. It's not to say that traditional public schools don't, students don't learn, but we're just benchmarking against that. And so when the bars are above the line, that means the charter school students are making more progress in, the, in an average year. And when the bars are below the line, they, that means that they're making less progress. Well, how many people in the room know what standard deviations are? This is an erudite group. I usually only have one or two hands. Uh, not many people walk around thinking in standard deviation units. So we decided that we would try to do a transformation of standard deviation units into something that real people can understand. And the unit that we're using is called a day of learning. And here's the way that we do this. We think about a traditional public school student who is the typical kid in California. And let's just say from fourth grade to fifth grade. He's the absolute middle of the pack in fourth grade, and he's the middle of the pack in fifth grade. He's the perfect average kid. His academic progress over the course of a year is then equated arbitrarily to be 180 days of learning. He's the average kid, right? School is 180 days. So now what we do is we say, OK, well then if the bar is above the line, of 180 days of typical growth, then we can translate that into how many, what does the learning for, for a charter school student look like as though they had gone to school not for 180 days, but 180 days plus a few more. So it's not seat time, it's just a, it's a construct of effective learn, days of learning. And if the bar is below the zero line, we're saying essentially it's as though he did not go to school for 180 days it's minus a few days of learning. And so we've taken standard deviation units and we just basically translated them into this idea that you've effectively learned a few more days worth of stuff in a year or you've not learned as many days. 0.01 standard deviations translates into roughly seven days, okay? So whenever you see 0.03, whether it's plus or minus, that's 21 days of learning, right? And 0.01 is seven, and we can work it out from there. So what we've got here is the California report showed that students learned about 21 extra days of learning in their reading, and they lost about seven days of learning. They're lagged behind uh, about seven days in math. But in Los Angeles, they were strongly positive in both ways. And let me just say that the co comparison here is the twin that's drawn from, from Los Angeles, right? So 
our baseline twin in California encompasses the whole range of charter schools and their twins. In Los Angeles, we're only comparing to Los Angeles twins. So part of the reference points here are going to be a little bit different. So the, the extreme results that you see in Los Angeles are tempered a little bit by the fact that the base of comparison is a little bit lower. Everybody clear on that? Okay. Let me also say that the California results are very sensitive to how many growth periods you include. So we did a sensitivity test on this, and it turns out <clears throat> that you move the window a little bit, and what you end up losing is 0.01 standard deviations plus or minus. So in another study that we've done, you'll see that it's positive 0.02 and negative 0.02. In another study, it's positive O3 and negative O2. It really just matters. It, it, it's very sensitive to how many growth periods we include. But the, the basic story is the same. Charter school students learn more on average in California in reading and have a little bit less learning on average in math. But in Los Angeles, no matter what we did to the data, the data are positive. Okay, remember I said that including five growth periods might be a little bit problematic. <coughs> What I'm showing you here on this slide is that we've actually taken the individual calendar growth periods, so from 0506 to 0607, from 0607 to 0708, and broken them out and given you the, the, the growth period specific results. And what that allows us to do is to actually see if there's a trend in what we're seeing. In the, we've seen the, the <coughs> average across all of them. Is there a trend that we see? And <laughs> what we see for California is that there's been a little bit of a dip in the middle of these periods that we started to study. And when we look at the schools that open up in the middle years here or come online to us, that's what we're seeing. That we have a, a little bit of a quality dip. There are new schools coming online in the 08 and 09 and 10 growth periods, and they're dragging down the results. But because a lot of the schools that have not been doing well are now being aggressively intervened with, we see it going back up in the most recent growth period. What we see in Los Angeles is that even though the numbers are declining, the numbers are, are still strongly positive in spite of the fact that there's really rapid expansion of charter schools in the Los Angeles market. And you would expect as you're moving into greater penetration of a market, that you're going to be moving more towards the average of the market anyway. So we would expect a slight decline, <clears throat> given the amount of penetration that we see in Los Angeles. But again, in every single growth period in, in Los Angeles, the, the effects are positive. The effects of, are positive all the time in math, and they are negative or not significant in all time periods in, in the California statewide results. Okay. One of the things that are big in California, big emphasis is on supporting the expansion of CMOs. And I'm gonna be talking about CMOs a little bit later in a, in a slightly different context. Here I just wanna show you what the results tell us. When we looked at the performance of schools divided into whether or not they, part, they were a member of a CMO network, the results in California as a state of a whole were a little bit sobering. That the CMOs seem to be where the power game is, and the independent one-off schools seem not to be able to bring it as well. The story is positive for both sets of schools in Los Angeles. And what this starts to tell us is there's an authorizer dimension here that we're seeing. That if the authorizer the largest authorizers in California are local education agencies. And if there is a concentrated attention to quality, as you can see on both sides of the equation in Los Angeles, you're going to get quality. If, in fact, there's not a large attention to quality, either from the CMO itself insisting on quality within its network or the authorizer insisting on quality, then you can start to see some of this negative pattern of behavior. And so when we look at the non-CMO schools across the state, they tend to be one, one standalone schools authorized by a local education agency, have been in business for a long period of time, and their pattern of performance has not been strong. 
And so here's where they sit. I see a question. I'm oh, sorry, uh, could you uh, see a moat? What does that sound for? Oh dear, I'm so sorry. Uh -huh. No, so charter management organizations are organizations that are allowed to have multiple schools and operate them simultaneously. So think of them as a uh, charter school district, but those schools do not necessarily have to be in the same geography. I'm sorry, I should have explained. Okay, so keeping in mind that whole thing about local education agencies being the authorizer, let's take a look at the location of the school. So this has something to do with the student populations that you're likely to draw into a school, as well as who the authorizer is and what they're talking about. So here you can see, again, Los Angeles is pretty um, insistent, regardless of the students that are drawn in, there's a really strong focus on quality. I'll talk to you about where that quality exists, where it occurs in a moment. And what we see in the statewide picture is that urban, in the, in the entire state context, urban and suburban are the only places where we see positive performance. And so what this is suggesting is that uh, where we end up with town and rural charter schools, these are a large number of the one-off schools that are being authorized locally by an LEA. <coughs> one really needs to ask the question, why would an LEA, when they could get their students back and get those dollars back, why would they let a, stu a school stay open for as long as they do? if the performance looks like this? That's an open question. I'd love to get your reactions to it. Okay, so now we're gonna start delving into individual student subgroups. One of the reasons behind the charter school um, <clears throat> policy was the idea that schools could potentially um, use the flexibility that they get to create more tailored education solutions for the students that they were serving. And particularly in urban areas, one of the big drivers of charter school operation is the idea of intentionally serving populations that have had a long history of the schools in their communities not performing well. And so we want to know, okay, if that's your mission and that's where you choose to focus, how are you doing? So I'm going to be working through the next few slides of student <coughs> subgroups that are of interest to policymaking. And what you see here is completely independent of location in both the state as a whole and in Los Angeles, students who are black who attend charter schools have better academic outcomes in both subjects. Now the advantage in, uh, in the state as a whole for reading is about what you see statewide. It's about 21 extra days of learning. But the difference in their math performance is really striking. That's seven additional days of learning for black kids compared to, their comparison would be what their twin black students grew in their traditional public school setting. Likewise, the state of a whole, it's a, I mean, sorry, in Los Angeles, it's about 14 days of additional learning per year. That's a, a, a pretty interesting finding. Let's, let's look at some other subgroups and see what we find. When we look at Hispanic students uh, for the state as a whole, we see that there's not as much of a positive effect in reading. It's about seven days of extra learning in a year's time. Uh, and we find that they lag behind in their math progress even more than, the state, than all charter school students as a whole. So they're lagging about 14 days instead of seven. Um, the case is not the same in Los Angeles. Los Angeles has very strong results from Hispanic students in both subjects. I have to tell you, this particular result is very unusual. When we do city by city breakouts in, in other parts of this country, we don't see strong Hispanic <coughs> results like this. And so these are really a, a, a pretty interesting finding for us. Asian students, remember we had a smaller proportion of Asian students. They tend to enroll uh, largely in urban communities. And what we found is that uh, they are not advantaged statewide if they attend charter schools. Uh, and they are a little bit ahead in math, uh, in reading by about 14 days, and their math gains are not statistically significantly different than what they would have gotten had they gone to their traditional public schools. 
This is one of the, the most fascinating slides to me. Across the state as a whole, now remember back to the urban, the, the location slide, that we've got a lot of suburban, rural, and town charter schools. <clears throat> the state as a whole, white students are not doing as well. Remember the demography. We have a greater proportion of white students in charter schools than we saw in the feeder schools or in the state as a whole. So we have an ugly sore spot right here where white students are just not getting the academic gains in charter schools that they would have gotten had they stayed in their traditional public schools. The story in Los Angeles is they're just about the same. They get 14 days of extra learning and, and reading and no difference in math. And remember that the baseline is Los Angeles, so which is below the state as a whole. So I, I'm just fascinated by the story here because this is a story of obvious choice, but I don't know what they're choosing. I think we were in poverty, weren't we? I mean, yes. we were looking at poverty, right? <clears throat> uh, I have a colleague at Stanford University by the name of Sean Reardon, and he's come up with some really interesting research that says ethnicity is not the driver of differences in outcomes for kids, it's poverty. And so we have a really strong interest in finding out whether in our examination of student progress we see the same pattern. And what you see here is, in fact, <clears throat> students in poverty are advantaged by going to uh, to charter schools. This is independent of their ethnicity. So we've taken out the effects of ethnicity and we're just looking at the effects of poverty here. And the, the magnitudes of uh, gain, extra gain for students in poverty isn't a whopping margin of, of improvement, but it is 14 days every single year extra in math and it is 28 extra days, I'm sorry, 14 in reading and 28 extra days in, in math for the state as a whole. And in Los Angeles, it's the same increment in reading, but it's, again, 42 extra days of learning in, in math for students in Los Angeles who go to charter schools. Do you have a question? Well, yeah, what is the measure of poverty? Eligibility for free and reduced price lunch. Uh, okay, well, so we've talked about black students having an advantage. And we talked about poverty students having an advantage. But <clears throat> many of these charter schools that intentionally locate within really distressed communities are in fact dealing with students who come to school with both of those characteristics. And so we wanted to know what happens when charter schools are educating students who are both black and in poverty. We consider this to be multiple challenges in the same way that a student who might have special education and uh, a language challenge might be multiply challenged. So we're looking at black students in poverty here, and you can see that this is really one of the sweet spots for charter schools across the, across the state and in Los Angeles as a whole. Um, <clears throat> so we have really strong results in both places, uh, and we find similar results when we zero in on the Hispanic student who is also in poverty. Remember, the Hispanic results for the state as a whole were not that outstanding, but here we're getting really strong charter impacts. Their learning gains are better in charter schools than they would have been had they gone to their traditional public schools. So the interesting thing here is what's the proportion of Hispanic students who are in poverty versus Hispanic students who are not in poverty in the state as a whole? I was quite surprised to learn that 44% of the Hispanics in the state enrolled in charter schools are in poverty. The majority are not. And so when you go back to that rural and suburban and uh, town profile, what you're finding is that the demography in those schools is largely white with a substantial Hispanic population. And those po students are not in poverty. Okay, special education, there's no story in Los Angeles. Their results are no different. Um, an unusual result for charter schools, we find here in California, which is that there is advantage to students going to charter schools who are special education students. Modest gains, 14 days and seven days in reading and math, respectively, but we typically see that this is not a place where charter schools do well. Not only do they not <coughs> engage a similar proportion of students, but their learning gains are not as good. So 
this is an interesting little thing and it sets up some questions about what's going on here and how can we think about that in terms of more generalizable policies. Question? <coughs> and finally, English language learners. Question? In the back. Uh, back to the special ed. Again, those students are matched with a twin disability? Mm. Okay. Sorry. When you say twin disability, you mean within special education or yes. specific classification? No, they're not. Okay. We have too smooth, too few cases in order to be able to do that. Okay. So that leads to more questions. But I'm sorry, I can't hear you. That that leads to more questions because um, there are questions about the severity of the disability in. Um, and if you're comparing one student who has a more severe disability compared to another student who has a less severe disability, then is that a fair comparison? I, I understand the limitation. Yeah. But, but you did match based on the, the initial test score. Exactly. So right. that, some of that would be captured in the yeah. initial match. Yes, the real ones won't be tested. True. Thanks. Have you read our studies? <laughs> 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 okay, so we've been sharing a lot of student level results and, and we're you know, sort of modestly optimistic about the results that we see in California. But you know, policy, you can post back in there, I know this, policy isn't made at the student level, policy made at the school level. And so the big question for us is on average, can we see <clears throat> charter schools uh, and their performance and compare that to some standard of comparison on the other side. And the way that we do this is that we take all of the students that we see in a charter school in a particular year and we average them. So we get a school average. That's pretty simple. And that average is how much in a year's time did the typical kid in that school grow academically. And then we go off and we get all the twins, because everybody's got a twin, and we average them too. And so what we're doing here is we're creating a virtual school out of twins, and we see what their average gains look like. Okay, so both of these averages have distributions around them. And the question for us is, uh, as a policy, can, if we're looking at a school level, do we see that schools typically are doing better than or worse than or about the same as their essentially counterfactual schooling situation? And so we've created something called the quality curve. Now, those of you who've been looking at charter schools for a long time may remember when we released our very first national study, we had a quality curve for math that said 17% of the schools were doing better, 46% of the schools were doing about the same, 37% of the schools were doing worse. Quickly became known in the charter school world as the dreaded credo soundbite. <laughs> Let me show you what the sound bite looks like for our more contemporary work. On top, you'll see the, the quality curves for both reading and math <clears throat> for the state as a whole. And remember that the, the base that we were comparing to was 37% significantly worse in math, and the state as a whole mirrors that. Uh, but at the top end, we saw only 17% of the schools were doing better in math nationally, and here we've got nearly 30%. So we've moved, moved the group essentially out of the no different than category and have a larger proportion of schools that are doing better than in math. The results are more favorable for reading across the state. 32% are doing better, and only 21% are doing statistically significantly worse, and the rest are about the same. So for the state as a whole, the Upside is stronger than we've seen in, in the larger context, but the downside still has the same concern. We've got significant proportions of schools that are still struggling to be, and, and are statistically significantly worse. Well, <clears throat> the, the, the layout is slightly differently portrayed for Los Angeles, but I think you can instantly see that the quality curve at the school level in Los Angeles is a much improved picture. Uh, than for the state as a whole. And in fact, <clears throat> the 22% in math uh, that are doing statistically significantly worse compares quite favorably to the 37% statewide, and 13% in reading doing statistically significantly worse compares favorably to the 21%. So we continue to worry about 
you know, we, we want to be able to celebrate the, the positive effects that we have, but we really want to continue to draw attention to the fact that there are these pockets of just residual underperformance. And I'm going to show you another way to look at that. And this is a way that we are moving to gradually as a more refined way of looking at school level quality. So again, we're only looking at the school comparisons here. <clears throat> and what we're doing here, this is for reading, is we're taking every single school and we're mapping them into the two dimensions. So the four columns that you see in each of these boxes represent a distance from the zero line, which is academic growth that's exactly the same as the virtual school. Okay, so if your charter school is doing absolutely the same as the, the kids would have gotten in their traditional public school, you sit on the zero line. And then as you move further away from that, you're either more positive if you're going to the right and more negative if you're going to the left. The rows are actually distribution, are, are based on the statewide distribution of absolute achievement. So ultimately what we want is we want kids to know a lot. And so while we're happy to see that <coughs> students are learning more in a year's time than what their traditional public school twin might learn, at the end of the day, we also have to really know what is it that they know in absolute terms? Where is their achievement? And how is the school actually helping their achievement move forward in the state distribution? So what you've got here are 16 cells of combinations of high growth, low growth, low achievement, high achievement. Everybody clear? We really like this table. Not everybody does. OK. And so then we color code it so it's easier to see. What you can see here is a really interesting story. The blue box in both of these things is the group of schools that are high achieving and high growth. And it turns out that the innermost blue box, the one that's closest to the midsection, those are schools that actually have started their students at a much, much lower level of achievement and have been able to bring them up. What you get in the outer three are a mix of an occasional school that's just really rocketed a, a group of students forward, and that's great. Or you've got kids who are high achieving to begin with and have high growth. Remember that Pacific Palisades group I was telling you about earlier, okay? Everybody with me? The white-ish boxes are schools that don't grow as much as their local option but are doing okay achievement-wise anyway. And so we kind of think about these as choice schools. These are schools that parents are saying, okay, I'm willing to trade off a little bit of academic progress because my kid's okay anyway, right? I'm particularly those <clears throat> sort of at the top of that. My kid's gonna be okay anyway. They've got high levels of achievement. I don't need to worry. I'm willing to trade off on a big push for academic growth? And the question is, okay, why? Is there something in the school that's really attractive and they're willing to make that trade off? Is it that they don't really think their kid needs to do that much work? We don't know. But there's an interesting story in the upper box about what that trade off is. From a policy perspective, the interesting question is, how much growth are you as a policymaker willing to allow being traded off? Right? I mean, if if you had schools that were way, way below their growth of their local market, could you tolerate that? Knowing that those kids are high achieving? It's an interesting policy conundrum. But the box that keeps us up at night is the lower right-hand box. Uh, and, and unfortunately, there's good reason to. These are schools that are not doing as well as their local alternatives and their kids are really low achieving to begin with. And, and I'm sorry, are, are still low achieving. It's not necessarily that they just started out low achieving. The combination of the fact that they started out low achieving and they have low growth is that they're staying in, in low levels of achievement. They're not having the academic progress that <clears throat> these other students are enjoying. And our quality curve was saying, you know, statewide it's 37% in math and 21% in reading. Well, you look at this in terms of what the actual impact in terms of achievement are, and the schools that are in these lower charcoal boxes, they're the ones 
that are just not getting the job done. And if there's a priority for attention and intervention, it's <coughs> going to be those schools. The, the MOVI people um, have better than average growth. And the theory here is, particularly for the upper half of this, um, that if they continue to have high rates of growth, that eventually those schools will rise and they'll move into the blue boxes. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the majority of those schools are in the slightly better growth than the local option, not substantially better growth than the, than the, than the local option. And we see the same pattern <clears throat> here when we look at math. Uh, can I have a time check from somebody? I'm fine. Great. Okay. So, you know, Credo does not have a policy position on charter schools. Did you have a question? I do. Um, did you do any of the, the school level stuff by level school, elementary, middle school, high school? I'm sorry. Are you asking do we have separate analyses for this? Yes. Uh, we do, but we didn't publish them. Because? Uh, they're very spotty. <clears throat> well, the reason uh, I ask was there has been, I recall, I don't know who did it, but some charter school analysis that suggested not too many years ago that um, on average elementary school performance of charter schools compared to comparable non-charter schools was significantly worse Middle schools were somewhat better, and high schools were kind of a toss-up. I didn't know if that. Right. So, so in in aggregate results, we have those <clears throat> tables, and they are in our reports. Okay. I just didn't bring them to you. Oh, okay. Okay. I thought you were asking for no stratified by elementary, middle, and we have done that, but you end up with lots of empty cells. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> no. So go to the report and yes. Okay. Enjoy. Did you study? Do anything, are these all seat-based charter schools or seat-based traditional schools, or do you do virtual charter schools or online charter schools? Do you study those? Are they part of the sample? They are part of the sample. Um, and I can tell you that in June or July of 2015, we are coming out with an exclusive deep dive on cyber charters. Uh, California is strongly represented, as you know. Uh, and interestingly, there are 850 some odd cyber charters across the country. And as far as we know, um, no, no extant research on, on them other than a modest thing that we did in one Pennsylvania study that took on a life of its own in the media and really needs to be updated. Because the theater might be different. Because don't <clears throat> virtual charter schools draw, don't necessarily draw from their theater elementary school. So I, I mean, they draw from all over. You are correct. Although so that, that I have to say, twin study a little bit. well, I have to say that the uh, it makes it easier for us to find twins from the standpoint of we have many, many more students to draw from, right? Because not if a school loses a student to a cyber, that school's entire student population becomes eligible for matches to that cyber school. So it's easier for us to get matches, with one possible exception, which is that a lot of the students who go to cyber schools are coming out of a completely different range of academic achievement. And so, and often can, we find it difficult to find matches. What we found in the cyber charter study is that it's actually easier to find matches for these kids because we match on prior test scores as well as, as, well as their, own, their own demographics. We also found that the, uh, the cyber charters that have statewide enrollment are really a very small subset of the cyber charters. Most cyber charters are affiliated with just small regions and have a very a much tighter feeder pool than we would have expected. But I can't talk about that until we clear through our state partners. So stay tuned. It gets better. Okay. So let me talk about performance drivers. You know, we, we don't have a position on charter schools. Uh, we're not pro or anti either charter or TPS. What we are in favor of is great schools for kids. And while we're interested in doing these sort of state, state of the status studies, we also want to try to get under the hood a little bit and find out what is it that we can see based on our data that might explain the quality that we're reporting when we do these graphs. <clears throat> and we did a study about a year ago, I'm sorry, about two years ago now, 
called Charter Growth and Replication. And I want to share a few of the factoids from that because I think they tell an interesting story. Um, I, I want to warn you, the next two graphs are a little bit gnarly. I will walk you through them, so don't freak when you see them. Here's the first one. What you're looking at here is the story of about 1,700 charter schools that we can see from the day they open through their birth, fifth year. Okay, so this is the birth and life cycle of, of brand new charter schools. And because we have all this data from all these states, we can do this. Uh, and what we did was we looked at their first observable growth period when we could see how much they would actually contributed to student learning. Okay, for some of them, if it was a middle school or a high school and we had data, that would be their second year. Sometimes in an elementary school, it was a few years in before we got test data on them. But when we saw their first increment of growth and we could get a measure of how they were doing, we took their <clears throat> performance and we divided all 1,700 schools into quintiles. Okay, So now we have five lanes, if you think about the boundaries that we used for that. We keep the lanes <clears throat> static. And then we watch and see how, so we've got our quintile markers, right? And then we see how the schools move across those quintile lanes as they grow up. Okay, does that make sense? Everybody got that? Okay, good, because now I can start talking about this. So across the top, we could say these are the starting quintiles. When we first observed them, they were a quintile one school or a quintile two, three, or four. Okay, then we want to know, based on where they started, do we, can we tell the next year where they ended up? And what you have here is, under each one of the starting quintiles, were they in the first or second quintile the second year, or were they in the third through fifth quintile? Yes? And so what you've got here is you've got, of at the first year age of the school, if we know where you are in the first quintile in the first year, the second time we see you, we know with 66% probability that you're going to be a one or a two quintile school. 66% of you ended up there. Only 33% of the schools actually made it out of the second quintile and improved to a third quintile. Okay, do you understand the pattern now? And then we add a year and we see what happens. Well, it turns out the second, in an additional year, if you are a quintile one school in year one, uh, <clears throat> then by the second year, can we tell with accuracy where you lie? And what you see here is that as schools grow up, we can tell with increasing accuracy where you're going to be, depending on where you started out. So the bottom line here is that if you're a low-performing school when we first see you, we know with 80% accuracy uh, if you're a first quintile school and 50% accuracy uh, with a second quintile school uh, and much more accurate moving up in the quality curve that you're going to be where you're going to be at the end of five years. So what this tells us is that the early signals of quality are pretty important. Now let's look what happens when we make it instead of a one year of conditional probability, wait and see after your first signal, we wait for two years to see where you are. And what you see here is that the values are even stronger. That what you end up with is low schools stay low and high schools stay high. And not much changes, with the exception of this middle group, the second quintile, where you got about a 50-50 chance. That's not great odds that you're going to make it out of the lowest two quintiles. So we conclude from this that it's much more uh, predictive early on about quality, and that makes it extremely important about who you let into the game. Okay, got one more slide to show you on this, uh, this stuff. Later in that same study, we looked at <coughs> charter management organizations. <coughs> we had 165 CMOs from across the country, and we wanted to ask the question, let me step back. It seems to us that a lot of the emphasis on CMO growth and development is this idea that CMOs are going to learn faster than individual schools about how to get better. 
that they have a greater capacity for modification and that they will improve over time in a way that doesn't happen with individual schools. Well, we wanted to test that. And so what you're looking at here are three different growth periods where we saw CMOs adding schools. And the question we tried to answer was, when we look at the new school that they've opened up, does that new school improve on the portfolio quality of the CMO? In other words, are they improving with newer schools? Are those schools opening up at about the same level? Or are those schools opening up at lower levels of quality than the portfolio? The blue is lower quality than the portfolio. The, what is that? Lemon, pumpkin, whatever, <laughs> is the same. <laughs> I want to draw your attention to how small the persimmon bars are. Um, in no year do we see <coughs> new CMO schools opening up with more than 30% of them doing better than their portfolio. So what we conclude here is, not only does it really matter who you let into the game, but all you're going to do when you replicate is replicate what you've got or slide backward a little bit, right? So I don't know where this comes out for you guys, but it comes out for us to say there's something really important about authorizing in this whole constellation of policy factors. We really need to pay attention to, policy, to, to authorizing. One more slide and then we'll wrap it up. Oops, that's true. I lied. Um, I wanted to show you at the sector level what happens with this. We had a study in 2009 of charter schools in 16 states. In 2013, we followed them and we said, okay, how many of them are still open? How many of them closed? It turned out about 10% of the schools closed. At the same time over that period, a bunch of new schools opened up. And so in our 2013 study, Previously existing schools accounted for about 80% of the <coughs> schools that we studied. 20% were new. Well, at the same time, because we're always doing this relative comparison with what's going on in the traditional sector, the other thing you have to think about is whether the traditional sector changed too. It could have gotten better, it could have gotten worse, and that will affect the way that we think about things. Okay. So, <coughs> remember that 10% of the charter schools closed since 2009. Because when I go to this slide, it's important. It's, is that a national? This is national. Okay, thank you. 16 states, not all of them. Oh. 16. This was the, the founding in 2009 for reading. The pattern is exactly the same for math. We had a negative result in reading for the 16 states taken together. If you drop the 10% that closed, from the 2009 sample and re-estimated, it is just trivially, trivially positive. In other words, the 10% were so bad that they dragged the 90% down to this. <coughs> okay, but think about the fact now that we have a marginally positive, like 0 .007 or something, number for the 2009 number. It doesn't get that much better in five years. And what we find is that the continuing schools are the ones that are creating this result. And interestingly, the new schools, that 20% of the new schools that make up the 2013, they're right back where we started from. Doesn't that sound, sound like quality at the front door again? So what we're seeing here is that from a modest, positive, trivial, and not statistically significant difference, over the five additional years that we have to look at, the schools did not improve all that much. And we see the exact same thing for math. So we're controlling for the fact here that the traditional sector didn't change, that's fine. But the schools that, didn't, that had been in business in 2009 didn't get that much better. So we're not convinced that you can age yourself to improvement, mm -hmm. and we're not convinced that you can replicate yourself to improvement. Here's the last slide I want to show you. In that national study, we studied differences across states. Now, what you're seeing here in these arrows is we've taken everything out of the equation. We've taken the age of the school, all of the differences in the student characteristics and makeup of the schools. What you're looking at here is 
differences across states in the average performance of a charter school in a year's time. And you have to ask yourself, <coughs> California is here, slightly positive in reading, just as we've been saying, and slightly negative in math. Um, you know, aside from the fact that you'd really like to be Tennessee or Rhode Island or DC, you can be really happy that you're not Nevada. <laughs> I try to bring a balanced perspective. But my point here is that this is, this is differences in the policy environment. And that covers authorizing, but it also covers other things too. Did you have a question? Yeah, so you're comparing, this is comparing only charters. So California charters to charters in all these other states. Is that correct? No, it's Thank good. you. You're not comparing against, you're not doing the same matching analysis. This is the same matching analysis. It's the same matching analysis, but it's the same comparison year state to state to state. Right. So right. everybody's getting matched against their twins. It's always relative to what the twins would have gotten. But we've taken everything, including starting scores, out of the equation here. So what you're getting here is raw policy. But policy has a lot that goes on inside it. Okay. So, let me just try to sum up. Um, the, the, the real bright spot in the studies that we've done in California is obviously Los Angeles. There's really strong advantages to students attending charter schools in both reading and math. The story is more subtle and more varied in the state as a whole for charter schools. Uh, the, the impacts are smaller and they're mixed. We saw that there's a lot of benefit to the students, to particular student subgroups. Um, and in particular, black students, particularly in poverty, Hispanic students, especially students in poverty. Uh, special education students, that's the real interesting thing for us and would love to have a conversation about what drives that. Um, and English language learners in reading. Um, typically, that's an, that's, that's an unusual finding. If we find an ELL effect, it's usually in math. But we find it in reading here, so that's cool. Um, and really we're continuing to be worried about that lower quadrant in what we call the quad tables, that there just is a persistent pocket of schools that are just not doing well, and three years in a bad school affects a student's trajectory for the entire public school career. So I feel a great deal of urgency to urge you to get on it. <laughs> uh, so authorizing, we see it's getting better over time. Closures definitely seem to be an important part of a cogent quality strategy for charter schools. I will open it up to questions about whether that also would be a cogent strategy elsewhere. We do see the flexibility of charter schools having an impact when they serve the media students, uh, and we think that's interesting. And for some of these things that are sort of really stunning results or really unusual results, these are learning opportunities. I don't think we do enough of trying to leverage what works well in one setting to other settings. And I mean that for charter to charter, TPS to TPS, and back and forth across that divide. So I think we have a lot of great examples that we can learn from in both sectors. Particularly want to see if we can leverage the innovations that we see in charter, charter schools and make that available to a much broader base of students. So with that, I thank you and I'll take any questions. Okay.